So now I want would like to welcome Karina Håkansson. She is a doctor in psychology, a social worker and a psychotherapist. She has founded the Family Care Foundation and now the Extended Therapy Room Foundation. Welcome. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, I am, as I said in the morning, I am both very happy but also moved to be standing here today and to meet with all of you. Many of you whom I have met several times, but also to recognize very many new faces, uh, which is great. There are also people, as I mentioned, maybe this morning, who have traveled long away from far away to come here. And of course, we appreciate that. I usually don't use manuscripts. I usually improvise, one can say, which is of course not improvisation, but which means that you have, have something in your mind several weeks, da 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 da, <laughs> and then it seems as if it is improvisation. Today, I, I, this time I have not had the space, one can say, to go with these things, blah, 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 due to this uh, symposium and, and also other things which has happened in our organization. So I, I have written a manuscripts, manuscript, which I will try to hold on to. And if it becomes too boring, give me a sign. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, this day is about alternatives and risks connected to pharmaceuticals. Or yesterday I learned psychopharmaceuticals is the correct uh, thing. But more than so, this day and other days is about people uh, we meet in daily practice. Living, complex human beings who for a short period of time or for a long period of time need support by other people. It is essential how these meetings take place and how those of us who are called professional helpers handle the situation. How we handle our own lives and the group and the organization which we are part of. It is also essential how other people around the person I now call client handle their life and situation, their family, but also other people around. As it is also important how they are met by me and other professional helpers. As many people have mentioned already today, to also invite and include important people. But it is also about society in a bigger framework. What kind of society do we want to create and to be part of? Is it a society where more and more people are defined in terms of psychiatric diagnosis? and where the treatment mainly consists of uh, psycho psychiatric drugs. It has been a steadily increasing number, both of psychiatric diagnosis, but also of um, prescriptions of these psychiatric drugs during the last decades to adults, young people, and also more and more to children. This is a big ethical issue, and we have to talk about it, but we also have to find alternatives uh, in a concrete way. We have to find a variety of places where people can, may go when life is at stake. Except psychiatric hospitals, there are very, very few places at the time being if you have no money, 
where you can go when life is too hard or where you can send your loved ones. For more than 30 years, I meet with people in daily practice, but I also hear about people in other places who do not want to be defined in terms of psychiatric diagnosis. In daily practice, I meet with people who not at all want to start to use psychiatric diagnosis, and I hear about people in other places who say the same thing. I also, in my daily practice, meet a lot of people who want support to get off their drugs. In our organization, the Extended Therapy Room, we meet with young people who feel anxious about their life, about their school situation, about friends, about how it at the moment or for a long time has been in their families. We meet with people who do not want to, who don't know how to handle another year in school. We meet with young people who hurt themselves. We also meet with families who have lost capacity to reach out to each other, to talk to each other. We meet people who have experienced a huge loss, and as they say, where fear and anxiety has taken over. We meet with people who are worried about their work situation or people who have no work at all to be worried about. We meet also with people who describe voices in their head. We meet with people who sense they have no place in society. People who in many ways have given up, but not totally and not yet. That's why we meet. <laughs> Some people we meet describe also how affected they are by things happening in the world. Dreadful wars going on, the climate change, the situation where thousands and millions of people have to leave their countries and their, their own life in, in their context. Others express in deeds and words feelings of not belonging, of being lonely. Some people talk about oppression, about rape, about violation. Is this supposed to be treated like a psychiatric illness? I would say no, it is not supposed to be treated like that. And I will try to describe how come I say no. As a young social worker, I myself got in touch with psychiatry and early on I realized it would not be possible to me, for me to work in a system which already at the time being was so focused on an individual based idea about human beings and interactions. A system which already 30 years ago uh, mainly diagnosed people who came there and already 30 years ago prescribed a lot of psychiatric drugs. I did not believe in a system which was organized and still is organized by clinical wards where people stay for a, a couple of days or for a longer period of time. People who have absolutely nothing in common but the fact that they right now are in a psychiatric ward. I found it hard to see how it would be possible to recover in a system with, which did not take into account that which is important for most human beings. Continuity, relationships, trust, to have time, to meet someone who is willing to listen, and, and maybe more than anything else, 
to be met as a human being by another human being. At the time being, which means 30, 25 years ago, there were some exceptions. And now I talk about Sweden. <laughs> there were some wards at some hospitals where people, both those called patients and professionals, were listened to and where their voices were heard and where their experiences were seemed like essential. Some brave leaders, some psychiatrists, nurses, caregivers, and psychologists made a change which is described in research and also in textbooks. By, for example, Barbara Sandin, Alain Tupour, where are you, Alain Tupour? And Johan Kullberg, to mention some of the most, for me, important people. Most of these words do not exist anymore. Unfortunately, as we have heard also today, the diagnosis are more than ever, the prescriptions are more than ever. And not just uh, to adults, and, but also to young people and to children. And this is, I want to say again, a huge ethical problem. It seems as if the psychiatric system has learned very little during the 30 years since I started to work what, about what is important when life is at stake. But it also seems as if there is a lack of knowledge about human reactions to life difficulties and life dilemmas that most of us recognize during a lifetime. Sadness, grief, rage, anxiety, angst, all these strong feelings, reactions when life challenges too much or in a way which is not possible to grasp or to make sense of. In psychiatry, and unfortunately, as I think, which is also spread to many other pl places, by, by now, we, the existing system is built on, as, as Sami talked about, a very technical point of view. New management, um, new public management, and, and, and something which I don't think many of us feel uh, comfortable with. There are far better ways to meet people when life is hard, and it is necessary to find ways to describe human beings and life dilemmas and condition in better ways than is done. And to involve people of different kinds in a relational and contextual shared work, this has to be done and it has to start now. That is the reason for me to be standing here today but it is also the reason for our organization, the Extended Therapy Room, to exist. Early on, I, I want to say just a few words about my, um, what made an impact in my professional background. Early on as a social worker, I was blessed to meet with uh, some very dedicated uh, and engaged uh, people who worked close to so-called ordinary people with that which we call family homes. In the middle of Småland, and Småland is in the very south of Sweden, for those of you who don't know, neighbor to Skåne, <laughs> which is neighbor to Denmark, uh, they created a project which invited clients to stay in a family on the countryside to take part in their daily life. And at the same time, both the one here called client and the family home were supported by us who worked there, the, the social workers and, and also me as a new one. This I loved, to be in the middle of life itself, to make use of one's own experiences, 
and to work together without far too many restrictions, far too many wordings, far too many constructions, you can say. All of us, no matter if we were called clients, professional, or family homes, were involved and part of the shared work. Years later, this experience led to me to start the Family Care Foundation, where I was in charge for 27 years, I think, many years at least. Uh, through that, I learned a lot about participation, about presence, and about taking a personal responsibility uh, as a human being, meeting other human beings. Over the years, my workplace became part of a huge uh, national and international network and through that, I got to know about a lot of organizations and meet with people from all over the world. People who describe the same things no matter where on earth we live. The importance of being met by someone, by, by someone who is willing to be there when life is too hard. Someone who is authentic, which means someone who reacts, someone who responds, someone who involves herself or himself, someone who is not afraid, but willing to take part also of that which is hard to understand at the first place. People all over describe the importance of time so that trust can be built People describe the importance of structure in the meaning that we can know what will happen next. And people also describe the importance of continuity, mainly uh, in, the, in the meaning that you know, as Birgitta talked about before, that the person you, you start to meet, the person you start to give something about your life to, will also be there in the future and not be replaced by someone else. <coughs> I want to mention some important people um, in research and in, in practice, and, and by doing so, I leave out a lot of important people, and that you have to bear with me. But as a student, I heard about Barbara Sandin's work at Satos Hospital and it created such hope inside of me to get to know about it and to hear that people who used to be defined like chronic schizophrenic people, patients, were able to leave that role, you can say, but also able to leave the hospital and to live an ordinary life uh, together with other people in society. In her doctorate thesis, Sandin writes, in the summer of 1983, I participated in a psychiatric congress in Vienna. After having attended many of the lectures, I was depressed by the lack of interest in human conditions. I missed reflections about how people grow into the world, about humans and societal beings whose lives have meaning and content in relation to the people around them, and how psychiatric illness is intimately connected to conditions in life as well as our experiences in relationships. Barbro is here today. You are here today, Barbro. And I have no words to express how important uh, it has been for me to have you in my professional life and also in my own life <laughs> or in the rest of my life or how to say it. Um, it's also notable, I realize now when I, I, I read the quote, 
that this uh, Barbro wrote 1983. And these are the same things we are talking about today. 93, 2003, 2013, 33 years later, it's still the same reactions, the same wonderings, how come this is the way it is. Magnus Hald is also here today, and Magnus worked close to another very important uh, person for me, uh, Tom Andersen, uh, who was um, a family therapist, uh, a doctor in the northern of Norway, in Tromsø. I also know he was a very, very dear friend and colleague with, with you, Magnus. And uh, he, Tom died nine years ago, um, but he's very present uh, in my work and life, and especially days like this, since one of his very important messages was to the importance of inviting the people whom it concerned into essential conversations, to open up the, the, the therapeutic room and to invite people. He also used to talk about the language which might bewitch us in the meaning that we might think we know something just by putting a word to it. As for example, the range of diagnosis, ADHD, ADD, schizophrenia, bipolar, blah, 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 etc., etc. Oh. <laughs> Alain Tupour, as I mentioned before, is also here today. And, and, and you, he, and, and his colleagues have shown in practice-based research what the people call clients find most important. And as I have understood it, it is not it has not primarily to do with education or training and different kind of titles, but people who involve themselves, people who do not who do the non the unexpected, and who people who care and people who show that by actions and deeds. It is also my many years of experience, of course, by working close to family homes the essential importance of being there in daily action and deed, and to involve oneself as a human being. Some of the family homes which I have worked together with for many years are also here today. Ingela and Sia, I can't see you, and André, Helene, I don't think Frederick could come. Nay, I, I, I can't see you here. There you are, Helene. And there you are. And also Camilla and Anders. No, not Anders, but your son Johannes. That's true. When I talk about um, the importance of being a human together with other humans, it doesn't mean that knowledge is not needed. Rather the opposite. But we have to consider what knowledge is and what kind of knowledge is important when meeting people in life crisis. My assumption about what I call essential knowledge and reality has its theoretical roots in the phenomenological hermeneutic tradition, which one can say goes back in the Western world to Socrates. I think I can say that, Anders, can't I? Yes, I can. Anders is my is my supervisor for my doctorate thesis. It's, it's, it. And in modern time, of course, associated with Gadamer, Heidegger, Husserl, Hannah Arendt, and Linda Findlay, to mention some for me important. The phenomenological research tradition deals with described reality, the life world as it appears. And researchers agree on the importance of rich and complex descriptions of phenomena the way they appear in the lived reality. The phenomenological tradition is based on the knowledge that life itself affects and inspires both research and practice. 
One of the most important findings in my doctorate thesis is that it became so clear to me that the work described, which involved also myself as a psychotherapist, belonged to a band of people, a long tradition, who know the importance of the subjective knowledge and being part of the world. Joanne Greenberg describes in her book, uh, you know Joanne Greenberg, the American author uh, who wrote the book, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. She describes in her book the life-changing meeting with Frida from Reichmann. Elgar Jonsson wrote his book, Tuk Fursten, which describes how, as I said before, or I didn't say that before, but he describes how he could leave the mental hospital after seven years as being defined a mental patient after having worked things together with Barbara and her team. The last years, more and more people describe and mediate a knowledge which has its root in one's own lived experience as a former patient who used to be described in psychiatric terms and prescribed pharmaceuticals. I wish to mention some here who means a lot to me in my work. People who I can refer to when meeting people in daily practice who have never nearly lost their hope, who have never nearly given up the idea about a life to live in a different way. Olga, of course, who we listened to as the first speaker this morning, but there are several others, as for example, as for example, Deborah Lampshire in New Zealand, Rachel Weddingham, United Kingdom, Mette Ellingsdalen, Norway, Mette Askov, Denmark, who is the main character in Katrin Borges' movie, Mette's Voice, Laura Delano, United States, Will Hall, of course, who spoke before me, Jackie Dillon, who was mentioned here before, also from United Kingdom. Arnid Lauweng from Denmark. Dorothy Dundas, United States. Gunnel Bergstrand, our Swedish describer, movie maker, who also got, became known to many people through the film festival last year. And many, many, many other people. I have an essential knowledge that we have to listen to and that we have to take into account when we organize and when we describe the work we are doing. I want to quote also one of my favorites, a Danish philosopher, Kue Lögstrup. He describes the importance of putting a part of one's life in another person's hand and to be received. In his book, The Ethical Demand, he writes, by our very attitude to one another, we help to shape one another's world. By our very attitude to the other person, we help to determine the scope and due of his world. We make it large or small, bright or drab, rich or dull, threatening or secure. We help to shape his world not by theories and views, but by our very attitude towards him. Herein lies the unarticulated and one might say anonymous demand that we take care of the life which trust has placed in our hands. And that if, if something, those of us who are defined professional helpers should remind ourselves about every day. This is the demand and the challenge to never give up the idea to create places which are organized to, to meet 
people in deep crisis, to create space for humans to be met by other human beings. Organizations consist of people, and the people who are involved will affect and be effect of that which happens in the organization. No matter if we are called patients, professional helpers, family homes, or whatsoever. For many years, I was leader for an organization. And through that, I met with hundreds and hundreds of people, including leaders. Through that experience, I know something about power and also how to use power in a good way and in a not good way. You can use power to oppress people, but you can also use power in a way which makes change happen for the better. Many times over the years, I have experienced how to make seemingly hopeless situations become hopeful. <laughs> But I have also experienced the opposite. When there is no trust, and when there is no space for feelings, complexity, strong emotions and differences. It takes a lot to create a sustainable and humanistic organization, and we need to be aware of that when talking about alternatives. We need to keep in mind as Patricia Tudor Sandahl, a Swedish author, writes in one of her books, an organization without a vision is nothing but a crowd of people. Visions are needed to make changes happen, as is also dedicated people. Practice-based knowledge is also needed and good examples from all around the world described by research and in other textbooks, not just from psychiatry and psychotherapy, but from organizations in common which deals with human beings and human life dilemmas. Kerapudas Hospital, where Begita Alakare was in charge, is a wonderful example. There are others all around the globe. Groups and organizations which consist of dedicated, skilled, and courageous people who have a shared vision. The challenge is to get to know about them and to get to know how come they made it happen, how come they made the dreams come true. We have also a lot to learn from leaders and other professionals in different um, professional fields not at least, as, as was mentioned in the morning, through art and literature and theater and prose, uh, but also, of course, from ordinary people who know from daily life what is important and needed when life, as it feels, fall apart. We need leaders, practitioners, and researchers who focus on the importance of values who dare to leave the comfort zone, who are willing to acknowledge the fact that there are so many things we actually do not know. No matter how many manuals, numbers, and figures we invent and investigate in. We need people who dare to talk about that which is difficult, people who are willing to say that this we do not know for sure, but we will do our very best. Money is, of course, needed to make a change happen. Money to create smaller units where people can go in acute crisis and situations. Places which do, does not focus on finding causes or illnesses, but places which offers a safe space to rest, to sleep, and to meet with other people. We also need places where people can go without being examined, defined, and prescribed drugs. We need places where professionals from psychiatry work close together with professionals from social service 
to find ways together to solve the life situation together with the one whom it concerns. Regardless of whether we are called, regardless of whatever we are called, we are, as I have said many times, affected by that which happens around us and the situations we find ourselves in. We bear with us our history, our personal history, while we are also part of a larger context, which has been described many times during the day, how the existing system and the tradition, of course, also influence and, and make an impact on individuals as well as on society. Two minutes. There is a seemingly endless spectrum of theories, models and paradigms to consider in descriptions and reports about human beings and human existence. I want to quote also a um, professor in physics. His name is Ulf Danielsson. He says, According to quant mechanics, reality is created in interaction with the observer. However, the observer and the observed interact also with the world around them. Information leaks and gets lost forever. Chaos increases and so the flow of time just as the thermodynamics. And this is actually a very positive image of time. The future does not exist yet. We can still affect it, says Danielson. It is indeed a very optimistic message, but also very demanding. We have the power to affect that which happens, and at the same time, we need to keep in mind there are so many things we still do not know. Over the years, in close collaboration with other people, I have experienced the meaning of engagement, space, time, love, passion, you name it. But I have also experienced anxiety, anger, frustrations, feelings of hopelessness. I have experienced the power of conversations but also the opposite, when the meeting become a mess, when there is no understanding. Humans are involved and intertwined with each other. We affect each other and we react towards each other. My responsibility and mission as a psychotherapist and leader is to create, together with others, a safe space for meetings to happen, which hold different perspectives, and which, dot, and which does not define just one person as the problem. And for this to happen, I need to reveal something also from myself and to enter the room in my professional ro role, but also as me, the human being, Karina. Thank you. <laughs>